Shalom everyone. Uh, this is my second uh, YouTube since I came back from America uh, just before Passover. And uh, in the previous YouTube I spoke about my father. Uh, may his memory be a blessing. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about my mom and may her memory be a blessing. And the reason I'm telling you these stories about my father and my mother is because they are the background to my understanding of what's happening today with Russia, Ukraine, Crimea, etc. Um, and it's, I think, very, very strange that my BA at Hebrew University and New York University actually was not on Islamic studies, which is what I make my living on, speaking in, in the churches, synagogues, radio, TV in America and the world. Rather, my BA was in Sovietology and East European studies. So I have a very, very special angle to this because my father, as I mentioned in the previous YouTube, uh, actually came from Lithuania, Ukraine, Argentina, and um, even though it sounds like so far away and a hundred years ago sounds like so many years away, for me it's not so far because I'm 65 and uh, 50 years ago I was 15 years old. So uh, for me, it's, I'm still living all of these testimonies that I received from my father and my mother. Um, it has been shown in the hospital that, I, that, I, that I, we opened the window so we have a beautiful breeze here in, in uh, Ofra. And uh, it is a pleasure to be home in Israel with the windows open. You know, in the United States, you have the heating on and you have the air conditioning on, but all the old windows are closed. Here in Israel, the windows are always open, no matter what weather we have. So anyway, so um, my mom comes from a very, very unusual family. As I said last time, my father's family came from King David. I believe my mother's family came from the King of Poland, and I will explain this in a moment. You know, many times one hears stories from one's grandparents or great-grandparents or from cousins, and one does not understand the real meaning until decades later. Uh, I remember when I, 50 years ago, when I was 15, 16, that my grandfather told me a story that when people would go to come out of the, my, his forebear's office centuries ago, that they would prostrate in his presence literally prostrate as if he were the king of Poland. And I never really paid very, very much attention to this. Um, when uh, my brother became ill with cancer and uh, they did a DNA test on my brother, and my brother, like I have, we both have blue eyes, we have the same DNA, and they asked my brother, where did you get Norwegian genes from? So I said to myself, where did I get Norwegian genes from? And it's very interesting that my mom, who was blonde and blue-eyed, uh, she looked very Scandinavian, and uh, my mom actually looked like Ingrid Bergman, if you remember the actress Ingrid Bergman. Her father, my grandfather, who was the one who told me about people prostrating uh, in the presence of my great, great, great forebear or ancestor, um, was blue-eyed and red-headed. And he was actually a sergeant in the Polish army fighting the, the communists in 1920. And uh, as I begin to put the pieces together, I begin I think to understand what happened. My mother's maiden name was Kamian. Kamian in Russian and in uh, Polish means stone. And we were knighted by the King of Poland for building the walls of Warsaw. Now, you have to remember the history of the Jewish people. 2,000 years ago, the Jews were defeated numerous times by the Roman legions. And the Romans, after they would defeat those who were still alive, they would carry off the Jews into slavery and exile them, many of them, just to the other side of the Alps. In other words, north of Italy is Switzerland, the Rhine Valley. And Yiddish, the language known as Yiddish, is actually a derivative of the ancient Swiss German. Uh, we know this because we found in Cairo uh, parchments written in Yiddish from a thousand years ago. The Jews were already speaking Yiddish. These Jews settled amongst Germanic peoples to the north of Italy, north, north of the Alps. And uh, as the years went by, as the centuries went by, the Jews would find themselves migrating northwards along the Rhine River into the heart of Germany. And uh, the King of Poland, uh, from the history of my family, uh, called on my great-great-great-grandfather, forebear, 
to come from Germany to Poland to help to build the walls of Warsaw. I, my forebear was uh, evidently some kind of a contractor. He built the walls of Warsaw. Don't forget, in the 1600s, the king of Poland was Norwegian. Uh, the, the Norwegians, the Swedes, had conquered uh, vast areas of land. Uh, Peter the Great of Russia fought the Swedes. Uh, there were many wars that most Americans are totally unaware of. And Poland was ruled by Swedish kings, Norwegian kings. I believe that probably at some stage, this uh, forebear of mine was so uh, beloved of the king, found favor in the sight of the king, that the king of Poland probably said to him, here's my daughter, you're going to marry her. So what's my grandfather going to do? He's going to say, no, I'm not going to marry her. So I think what happened was that uh, he said to the king, well, I'm Jewish, and the king of Poland said, I don't care. <laughs> she can be Jewish, but you're going to marry her. Because many times kings would build a coterie of followers around them who would be loyal to them by marrying into the family. And so that's, I believe, where I got my uh, Norwegian genes from and blue eyes. And uh, what happened actually was that the Polish uh, kingdom expanded during this period of Jewish-Polish uh, alliance to include tremendous areas of uh, Ukraine and Russia. And we're talking about 1500s, 1600s, and um, the Jews, because the Jews knew how to read and write and the Jews knew mathematics, uh, the Jews were perfect uh, for use by the King of Poland as tax collectors and uh, people who would actually rule over the kingdom. And, of course, uh, you don't like tax collectors. So the Ukrainians and the Russians did not like the Jews because the Jews were tax collectors and they were servants of the king of Poland. So from here, now, I start the story of uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Crimea. I know many Americans uh, and many people all over the world uh, really don't have a grasp as to what's happening there today. What is uh, Vladimir Putin uh, going to do? Uh, what are the Ukrainians going to do? What are the Russians going to do? And what I'm going to try to do in this YouTube, and maybe the next one as well, uh, this is part two, and we'll probably go into part three, is to try to help you to understand uh, who the Russians are, and who the Ukrainians are, and who the Polish are, all these different Slava groups. Um, I have to tell you that uh, when I was studying Russian Sovietology and East European studies, uh, not only at New York University from 66 to 68, but in Hebrew University in Jerusalem from uh, 68 to 71, uh, not only did I learn Russian language and Russian history and Russian literature, uh, I also took a, a very unusual course in a language known as Church Slavonic. Church Slavonic is, I would say, the parallel uh, to the Slavic languages as, as Latin is to Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and Romanian. Uh, Latin is a language which is not really used today, neither is Church Slavonic, but the uh, churches today in Orthodox Eastern Europe, and in Russia, of course, use Church Slavonic as their liturgical language for prayers and for um, uh, their, their texts, and so I had the opportunity uh, to study Church Slavonic. Uh, the amount of Greek, by the way, in Church Slavonic is uh, much higher than it is in modern-day Russian or any of the other languages, uh, because the founders of Russian Orthodoxy, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in 995, were Cyril and Methodius. Saint Cyril, Saint Methodius were Greek Orthodox priests who were sent uh, to mobilize, to galvanize, to unite uh, the Slavic nations uh, and defend them from the uh, invasions of the Turks, the Tatars, the Chechens, and the Circassians. This is extremely important. Most Americans don't really have a clue about any of this, and it's important to understand it. The psyche of the Russian people, uh, the psyche of the Poles, the psyche of the Ukrainians, is all taken in light of a history of wars, with the Turks, the Tatars, the Chechens, and the Circassians. The names might be difficult for you to understand, but for us living here in Israel and the Middle East, uh, this history of a thousand years is very, very much on our minds because we are still living amongst these neighbors today. We know who they are, they know who we are, 
And um, most Americans basically uh, never learned any of this history. For most Americans, uh, American history may start with 1620 with the Pilgrims, or perhaps with George Washington in 1775, or maybe with Abraham Lincoln in 1865. It's very hard for Americans to grasp a history of over a thousand years with the uh, foundation of the Russian church. Uh, it's very hard for Americans to understand Islam, which has been around for 1,400 years. For those of you who are Christians or Jews who believe in the Bible, uh, obviously if you're a Christian, you know 2,000 years of the New Testament, and if you're some Christians and some Jews know the history of the Bible going back 3,500 years. But most Americans really do not have a clue about any of these things. And I say it with great pain. And this is one of the reasons I'm doing this YouTube. So the areas that we know today as the steppes of Russia, steppes are like massive prairie uh, lands, uh, flat lands. Uh, these lands were settled by Slavic tribes. Before them, you had Goths, you had Vis Visigoths who invaded Rome in, in 453. You had Lombards and you had Huns and you had all these different types of, uh, I don't want to say barbarians, because in those days everyone was basically a barbarian. And um, eventually the Slavic nations came in, also from the east, and uh, occupied what is known today as Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. And these peoples uh, all share the language that we know today as Church Slavonic, which eventually broke off into many, many different languages, just as our Spanish and Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, all came out of Latin. The Russian Orthodox Church came to defend the Russian, Orthodox, Russian people. The King of Poland, and this is very important to stress, is not Russian Orthodox. The King of Poland that we see here developing is Catholic. Uh, we see many, many different nations adopting different types of Christianity. So, for example, Poland, Russia, um, Ukraine. Ukraine is Catholic. Uh, Poland is Catholic, but R Russia itself is Russian Orthodox. Belarus could be ha having both groups. Um, Romania, Bulgaria are Orthodox uh, countries. And there's a great tension, again, going back a thousand years to the year 1053, with the split between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches. And I know that, I don't, I don't want to say I know, but I imagine most people who are going to watch these YouTubes are Americans. And like I said before, Americans think of the Protestants versus the Catholics, which is sort of 1500. But I'm talking now about the Catholics and the Russian and Greek Orthodox churches that have been opposing each other for over a thousand years. And this plays a very, very major role in the struggle between Russia and, of course, Ukraine and Europe, the Catholic countries of Europe. And so what we will do now is we will take a break now and we will go into the next, into the next teaching, the third YouTube.